This is Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith. I'm here with a person I consider to be an old friend, Dr. Peter Ward. He's a climatologist at the University of Washington. He's also a biologist, and he teaches, he explores, he goes around the world exploring. One of his specialties is why things go extinct, and maybe that's something humans have to pay attention. Peter, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thanks for having me again. You're the author of many books, Under a Green Sky, really turned my life around, frightened me a little bit, and uh, I now understand you have a new book that I'd like to talk to you about in a few minutes, but tell us what's the title and what's it about. Well, this one is dealing with sea level change, and sea level change is to me the most frightening aspect of anything that could happen with global warming and climate change. Global warming has turned into two of the most politically explosive words out there, but warming stuff really never, I mean, it isn't going to fry people to death. What would cause mortality? And the problem with climate change and mortality comes from too many people and not enough food. Let's go from, uh, tell us about your new book. Okay, my, my new book is dealing with what I think is the, the most significant and scary aspect of climate change, which is the fact that as we warm, which we are doing, Ice melts, obviously, and the ice that's melting is in the Arctic and Antarctic regions, and it is that ice melting that causes sea level to rise, and it's rising sea level that poses the most important threat, I think, to human civilization, not so much from the water coming in my office now and getting my feet all wet, but the sea level rise really affects us from what hurts us most, which is, to me, at least, on my stomach, feeding. Sea level rise is going to affect agriculture. Agriculture in a planet where we're at 6.6 .6 billion, going up to 9 billion, we cannot afford to lose low-lying agricultural grounds, and that's what sea level rise can do. Okay, well, I want to really dig into that in the second part of our interview. For right now, though, we've just had one heck of a summer. We had the uh, Russian heat wave, and, well, in fact, the hottest July ever, according to uh, NASA. And we had the Pakistan floods, as you know, and the Arctic ice is really low. Can you talk to us about some of those events and your take on them? Well, any one particular year or any one particular summer can never be used as a justification for a trend, obviously. But nevertheless, if we look at the last 10 years, we have some of the hottest, I forget how many of the year, hottest years on record. We're starting to really look like a trend. I think that the... Russian heat wave, as well as the Pakistan, uh, the, the way the monsoon worked, are two of the scariest nudges, really, that should get our politicians pushed to really understand this is not going to go away. Now, we may be followed by two or three very cold winters, or very, very cold summers even in Russia or somewhere else, and people will be tempted to say, aha, see, it's over. But it's not. Last winter in the U.S., we had one of the snowiest winters ever, and people say, look, there's no global warming because it snowed and snowed and snowed. Why did it snow so much? Because there was way more water in the air that hit the cold, cold Canadian air coming down, and you've got more water in the air because elsewhere it has been warmer than before. We've got more water vapor because of the heating. That hits a cold front, of course, it's going to snow out, but it's all part of the same problem. The warming of the planet is causing extremes of weather. Our civilization is based on a norm, not extremes. Extremes are never good, and extremes are really never good when it comes to feeding the planet. I think you bring out a really good point that it could be cold next winter, and that doesn't say anything. It's the long-term trend that's going. We had Senator Inhofe out there building a snow house for Al Gore just because it snowed in D.C. last winter. Come on. Uh, but the point is, these extreme events, it's been predicted they'll happen more often, and that seems to be what we're seeing. So isn't, when does the point come where we say, yes, this is climate change? Well, that's a great question. I believe that generation by generation, as this keeps ramping up warmer and warmer and warmer, that conversation will be over. But in the meantime, we need action now. I've been completely disappointed by the Obama administration and what it has not done for climate change. Yes, it pushed through health care, but climate change should have been number one because climate change will ultimately be, I think, a major factor in health care. When we start seeing on the global sense of uh, people without enough food, even if the U.S. and Canada can feed themselves, it's going to have an effect. 
The effect that happens is as our surpluses go away because of these extremes of weather, I mean, already because of the Russian heat wave, as we know, the wheat futures have been skyrocketing and food riots began in northern Africa already. We saw this about three years ago with a, a downturn in the amount of corn going out because of the biofuel initiative. So we start putting more, just a bit more corn in a biofuel and all of a sudden we've got food riots. We are really on a knife edge and extremes of weather are the ones that will affect us most importantly, which is why I think we have to at least start the conversation in a serious tone in the U.S. We've got to do something about cap and trade. We really have to do something about global climate. And yet that's off the menu for the Senate and, and, and for the House. Uh, they're just not, not going to do anything, apparently. No, it's not going to happen, especially until this election is over. And if the Republicans again take over uh, even the House of Representatives, what we can look forward to, at least in the United States, will be the next two years of investigations. No legislation, only investigation. And they've already said they're going to do that. You know, we'll take all these guys, put them in prison. This is not what the world needs right now. I just have this horrible sense, sinking sense that 20, 50 years from now, there'll be this rogues gallery of the guilty sort of lined up on some wall. These were the people that let down the human race. Well, the Arctic sea ice is again near a record low, but you say that doesn't really impact the rising seas idea. Can you straighten that out for us? Sure, it's just some of the best pictures you can get, and again, because the northern hemisphere is a lot more approachable than the southern, um, when the Arctic sea ice disappears, people think, oh my gosh, this is, this is really a big problem that's going to cause the seas to rise. My ice is melting. My gosh, the oceans are going up. But that ice is already floating on the ocean or sitting on the ocean. That's not the ice that affects us. It's ice on land that affects us. However, you cannot discount, you cannot say that the loss of Arctic sea ice is unimportant. In fact, there is a huge secondary importance to that. We can come back to that in a second. It's Antarctica and Greenland that really, I think, are going to dictate the fate for human civilization over the long term if we can keep the ice sheets in place. Sea level will stay relatively constant. It is ice that's sitting up on land that melts, that every drop of that water causes a rise of sea level. Every single drop on some minuscule fraction, there's going to be some slight rise in sea level. The floating ice, nothing. The ice that sits on Antarctica and Greenland are the two really most important sources of sea level change. How can you not have global temperatures rising and not see an increase in the melting of those two bodies? And in fact, we are seeing those. Now, why the Arctic ice is so important, it's white. It reflects sunshine back into space. A white planet is cooler than a planet this dark. It's called albedo. As we melt away the Arctic sea ice, we get dark ocean replacing white sea ice. That ocean warms. It warms the whole planet to, to some minuscule again, but some real fraction. The more Arctic sea ice melts, the warmer the planet gets, and there's a feedback here.